She has taught literature in inner city Atlanta, appeared live on primetime TV in Paris, and worked on a child survival campaign in Niger. Her most recent book, The Vaccine-Friendly Plan, with Dr. Paul's safe and effective approach to immunity and health from pregnancy through your child's teen years, is co-written with integrative, uh, integrative uh, pediatrician Paul Thomas. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Adele. Thank you all for being here this morning, this rainy morning in Washington, D.C. Um, so you already heard that my name is Jennifer Margulis and that I've been researching and writing about children's health for over 15 years. And I've written for hundreds of magazines, newspapers, and online websites. Um, the, I've also interviewed scores of medical doctors and other health professionals, as well as families um, and nurses and midwives and everyone across the spectrum. And by and large, the editors that I work with are bold and unafraid. I went into a maximum security prison to interview a man who had been accused um, of killing his mother. And I also interviewed a caregiver who pleaded guilty um, to, 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 to uh, stealing from the elderly while her boyfriend in the background was screaming obscenities at me. And in those instances, my editors have been there lock and step with me, um, supporting me and helping me and being unafraid. And in general, I think that editors and journalists are totally committed to telling about the real issues of our time, except when it comes to vaccines. When a journalist like me wants to write about vaccine safety or vaccine injury or specific financial implications of certain vaccines, we get hit with a wall of silence. Often, our editors are simply baffled. There's so many things that they don't know. But often, they also feel that it's too dangerous for us to write about it. So sometimes, and we heard a little bit about this, it's, the, it's advertising dollars and you know, magazines and television has to, has to take care of their advertisers. But in my experience, it's more often because the editors feel that we would genuinely be doing a disservice to the American public if we talk about issues in, to, in conjunction with vaccines. And that if some readers read stories like that, they would think that those stories were anti-vaccine and they would think that maybe some people would choose not to get the vaccine and then somehow that magazine or that newspaper would be implicated. There's a perception that if you write about things fairly and accurately, if we tell stories of doctors who have modified the vaccine schedule and who are enjoying outstanding results with their children, or if we tell stories of the parents whose children have been injured by vaccines, some of whom are in this room today, that we are doing a disservice to our children's health and to the health of our nation. But that is wrong by not fairly and accurately representing both sides of the vaccine debate, we are doing a disservice to our nation's children. We have to talk about vaccine necessity, we have to talk about vaccine efficacy, and we have to talk about vaccine safety. If we don't, we are throwing a generation of children under the bus. Some of the editors who are older and lots and lots of journalists who are brave and strong and who want to tell the truth don't really understand what's going on. They don't know, for example, that we have one of the most aggressive, if not the most aggressive, vaccine schedule of any country in the industrialized world. They don't know that we give a vaccine for a sexually transmitted disease to every newborn in America regardless of risk. If your child was born before the 1980s or if you don't have children, that's something that's not on your radar screen. You just simply don't know that hepatitis B is one of the vaccines that's manda mandated by states for entry into school. They also don't know that we're vaccinating for illnesses like rotavirus, which is a mild and common childhood illness that virtually every single American child gets by the age of five. Many of you may not have ever heard of rotavirus because it's so benign for American children. That changes if you go to a different country and you don't have access to clean water and you don't have access to good medical care. But in the United States, 
children who get rotavirus do not have problems. And a lot of people look at me like sur with surprise when I'm talking to older audiences. They don't even know that chickenpox is now a mandated vaccine. So the questions that we have to ask are, are all these vaccines really necessary? Is it safe to give so many vaccines to such small children? And is it possible that in our enthusiasm for an important tool in the medical toolbox that we've added so many vaccines to the childhood vaccine schedule that we're inadvertently doing damage to our children's immune systems and to, the, to their brains, at least to some children? So you've heard a lot of different science from a lot of different people, and there are several scientists also in the audience. And I want to tell you, looking at this from a bigger picture, that the most accurate answer to that question is that we don't know. There are more unknowns than knowns in this debate. But if we don't ask the questions as scientists and as responsible, brave journalists, we are not going to be able to find out the answers. These are not rhetorical questions. These are answers that do have, these are questions that do have potential answers. And what we do know is very clear. We know that thousands and thousands of parents are reporting harm directly following vaccination. We're seeing that story over and over again. I brought a healthy child to the doctor. The doctor vaccinated my child. The doctor recommended I do Tylenol. Two weeks later, my child got an ear infection. Then I did a round of antibiotics. And then my child's health started to slip away. You can't continue to call thousands and thousands of stories an unfortunate coincidence, because it's not. We also know that nearly every scientific study that has been done on Tylenol, that drug that I just mentioned, acetaminophen, has shown that it has neurotoxic effects. An article came out in a peer-reviewed journal just two weeks ago from Duke and Harvard University researchers doing a summation and an overview of all of the researchers' research on acetaminophen. And what those researchers are positing is that acetaminophen is having a, is have, playing a causal role in the explosion of brain disorders and autism that we're seeing today. And what are we hearing about that in the media? Very, very, very little, if anything at all. We also know, as you heard from Dr. Thomas, that the cumulative effect, the cumulative amount of aluminum that we are injecting into our children far exceeds federal safety guidelines. And one thing you might not know is that we give a vaccine at birth. We also recommend that every newborn get a vitamin K shot. That vitamin K <coughs> shot also contains aluminum. It's inaccurate for journalists to portray this issue as a pro-vaccine versus a pro an anti-vaccine debate. That is not what's going on here. I might be wrong, but I may be the most vaccinated person in this room. I lived and worked in West Africa as twice in my adult life. I've been vaccinated for things like yellow fever that most of you probably haven't gotten. I chose to vaccinate my children. I, for one, am very grateful to have the option to do vaccines. Um, my co-author who's sitting here, Dr. Thomas, gives vaccines in his office every day. This is not about being anti-vaccine. Asking questions about vaccine safety and vaccine necessity and vaccine efficacy doesn't make you anti-vaccine. We all want the same thing. Whatever side of this debate you're on, whatever you think about these issues, we want the same thing. We want healthy children. We want them to have robust immune systems so that if and when they are infected with diseases that they do not suffer from those infections and that they do not die from that. We do not want our kids to be suffering from autoimmune disorders and we want them to have healthy bodies and healthy brains. But our kids in America are sicker and more brain damaged than they've ever been before. That's why we're here. That's why I'm writing about a topic that's really career suicide for a journalist. <laughs> we're having this conversation because our kids are unwell. So doctors and scientists and journalists, I think, need to work together to press the government to form an independent vaccine safety commission so we can get to the bottom of this. We cannot let our bias or our ignorance get in the way of fair and accurate reporting on the issue of vaccine safety. So Anderson Cooper, 
<laughs> who has dismissed parental concerns, per dismissed evidence-based concerns about vaccines and vaccine injury, sent a team to Ashland, Oregon. In Ashland, Oregon, where I happen to live, there are many educated, smart, well-informed, community-minded families who choose to forego some or even all vaccines for their children. His cameraman who came to interview those, that hotbed of anti-vacciners, right? His cameraman had had a baby three months before. I asked his cameraman if they had chosen to do the hepatitis B vaccine. He told me, you know what? We've decided to wait. So I want to ask you a question. Does the fact that Anderson Cooper's cameraman had chosen not to follow the CDC schedule for the early months of his child's life, does that make CNN a hotbed of anti-vaccine <laughs> crackpots? Yes. 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 Not all vaccines are safe for all children. We must do more detailed, more balanced, and more accurate reporting. I call on the American media to stop censoring this conversation and to start telling the truth about vaccines. Thank you.